Right. So, with luck, when I press this button, um, you will be, see the screen that I want you to see. Very. Ah. There. Okay. Right. There's, there's evidence on my screen that your screens are showing what I want you to want you to see. In other words, the title of my lecture. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. So, <coughs> um, the um, talk that I'm going to give is a, a mixture of talking about Percy Ludgate and chat and GPT because chat GPT was an un unintended interruption in our work. But anyway, uh, that's going to be the uh, somewhat strange uh, uh, talk that I'll, uh, I'll give you. If I can, there we are. Um, that plaque, uh, uh, shows uh, uh, Percy Ed Edwin Ludgate and described there in Dublin as uh, the world's second computer uh, inventor. Ludgate's machine um, uh, is known about just because of one paper that he wrote. It was a paper that appeared in the uh, in 1909 in the Royal Dublin Society. I stumbled across this paper, literally, uh, when I was um, uh, writing my inaugural letter, uh, lecture. I was actually looking for something interesting and different to say about Ada Lovelace. Uh, I had um, chosen as the uh, subject of my inaugural lecture, uh, the gentle art of programming. And I... Who said that? Are people hearing me properly? Yes. Yeah, okay. Somebody just said, I didn't catch that. Would you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> and what's more, it sounded rather electronic voice, which is very confusing. <laughs> <clears throat> let's, um, let's continue. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was looking for interesting and different things to say about Ada Lovelace. And I stumbled across um, a paper by Percy Ludgate about Charles Babbage. And th that paper ended with uh, a paragraph that rang real bells with me because it said something along the lines of, um, I too have designed an analytical machine. And it's described in the Royal Dublin Society Proceedings. The University Library uh, here at Newcastle, uh, to my pleasure, had that. And I soon found myself reading that, uh, that paper. That led to uh, my uh, doing quite a lot of investigation. First time I tried to do historical investigation at that point, and a computer journal uh, paper um, about Ludgate's machine and about Ludgate himself. To my amazement, now looking back on it, for about another 50 years after that, essentially nothing further of significance was found about Ludgate and his machine, um, uh, though the story that I told um, started becoming part of the uh, the standard account of the origins of computers as written up by various people. But then, about six years ago, Brian Cochran, curator of the Mag Magnific Magnificent Computer Science Collection at Trinity College Dublin, started asking me, uh, emailing me, started asking me questions. Embarrassingly, almost invariably, there were questions whose answers I didn't know, or if I'd ever known them and had forgotten. Um, that gradually sucked me uh, into his uh, little team um, that was trying to research uh, Ludgate. And so for the past five, six years, 
I've been working quite intensively uh, with Brian and his colleagues on that. That's led to the publication of um, two quite lengthy papers on, uh, on Landgate and his machine, uh, a big collection of material that Brian and I uh, co-edited into a, into a book, and more recently, one very little paper uh, about Ludgate and ChatGPT. I went across to Dublin in October last year, where there was uh, uh, the ceremony to unveil the plaque on the house where he lived and, and did his work. But the day before that ceremony, um, we learned from a German colleague um, that uh, Ludgate's work uh, had not been completely forgotten um, during the, the period up to and after World War II, um, but rather it had been um, uh, used uh, in a successful attempt to prevent Percy Ludgate, uh, sorry, Conrad Zuser, the German pioneer, from getting a, a patent on basically on program on the notion of a programmable computer. Uh, that patent, if it had been granted, would have been uh, with priority from 1941. Um, and it's interesting to speculate quite what impact, if any, such a patent would have been, uh, would, would have achieved. What had happened, um, uh, we had learned, was that in 1960, a, a German company that we didn't, we'd not heard of, uh, Triumphwerke, um, which um, made and sold um, uh, motorbikes, but also office machinery, um, uh, had succeeded in uh, uh, their opposition uh, over several years uh, to um, Zuzer's patent, and they'd done so uh, by providing a copy of Ludgate's 1909 paper. Until then, we'd, uh, we had believed that essentially from about 1915 or 16, through to my discovery uh, of the paper in 1971, that um, uh, almost nobody had uh, had known about Ludgate, mm -hmm. and certainly that he had had uh, no impact at all on all of the all of the early work on uh, on computing. What's more, we also found interestingly. Uh, that Zuza had been claiming that his patenting difficulties um, uh, were due to the behind the scenes efforts of IBM. Hmm, interesting. Clearly, this invigorated our, re uh, our research, to say the least. And um, uh, we worked uh, uh, and have been working ever since, since our last October, uh, on, on that issue. But there was an unplanned detour uh, uh, with the release of ChatGPT. Uh, I assume and hope that I don't need to say much of, uh, uh, about uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, what happened, uh, We like just about everybody else, um, we were very impressed by its ability to produce very plausible, very well formulated answers to questions on a huge variety of topics. And so we thought we should ask it about uh, um, Percy Redgate, in particular, um, because we saw several uh, uh, accounts which were suggesting that chat GPT was going to be very good to help, for example, uh, uh, historians in investigate, doing their investigations. I'm showing there a, a, a quote by one Marcin Frankovic. My apologies to, to him for my mispronouncing his name. Um, 
uh, which provides a set of extremely positive, extremely uncritical comments about chat GPT uh, as being something can, that could revolutionize uh, historical investigations and the way historians should do, do their work. <clears throat> so we decided uh, that was just one very uh, uncritical account uh, to uh, try and find it uh, and more. We, of course, did not use chat GP GPT to try and find uncritical comments about itself. Um, uh, instead, we used Google and Google Scholar uh, and were unsuccessful. So we decided to do, try out chat, chat GPT ourselves. Those are the 12 prompts or questions um, uh, that we used. Uh, for those who don't use ch uh, no chat GPT, uh, you really do chat to it. You ask it questions in, in English. Uh, you can guide uh, uh, the answers that you're, you're getting. And this was our attempt at using chat GPT that way. Um, I am going to uh, uh, give you an account of what chat GPT in response to just several of those, those prompts. I'm certainly not going to go through all of them. Um, here's the, uh, the prompt. Uh, it was typed into chat GPT saying, what is known about the life of Percy Ludgate who invented computing? The text you see below there is verbatim, the complete um, uh, uh, response obtained from um, ChatGPT to that question. That response is very literate, very plausible, very interesting. We would have been really excited uh, at, at that response had we not known quite a lot about Percy Ludgate already. Um, you will see that um, various bits of that response are uh, are coloured in. Um, the reason, as I'm sure you will have, uh, have guessed, is that those were parts of the response um, that caused our eyebrows to rise. The trouble is, there is no evidence for any of those highlighted assertions. They are completely fictional. They're very believable, they're very plausible, but they're wrong. Uh, I'm sure that you can read that slide faster than I can speak it, and I'm not going to speak it all, um, but uh, the, uh, those um, so-called hallucinations or alternative facts, as I think Trump might call them, um, are uh, examples of, to my mind, quite startlingly, uh, as I say, plausible uh, lies about Percy Ludgate. Right? He didn't start his work uh, in 1907. He didn't say that he was inspired by Babbage, etc. So that was one of our, in fact, uh, the, our reactions to that first uh, answer to our first question. Skipping on to the sixth of our questions, what is the evidence that he wor worked as a civil engineer in both Ireland and England? A previous answer had stated that he'd worked as a civil engineer. So we thought, right, well, let's find out why you think that. <clears throat> and the answers that we got back uh, again, very plausible, very well written, and absolutely false. Um, ChatGPT told us that there was an article in the Irish Times, um, uh, even said uh, where and who he worked for as a civil engineer, and um, uh, went on and said that he'd invented the machine for testing the strength of materials. This is all extremely interesting and all nonsense. 
uh, he uh, did not make reference in his own writings to his work as engineer. He never described himself as a me mechanical engineer. And there is, <coughs> though there's only limited information about his life and his, his career, there's nothing to show anything to do where, with civil engineering. In a certain sense now, we were bo getting both more fascinated by and more furious at ChatGPT. That summarizes it, okay? Our reactions to that sixth of our, of our prompts. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's no such letter. There is such a firm, a real firm of consulting civil engineers, but there's no evidence that he ever worked for them or that he was anything to do with the Royal Society of the Arts. The polite thing there is to say, these assertions really need corroboration. I it wouldn't bother if I were you. Okay, so uh, ChatGPT was telling us about all of these um, citations and so on. So we thought, let's delve into that a bit more. Please provide the full citation for the Irish Times in 1922 and the corresponding text. I can almost imagine myself grilling a PhD student uh, with questions like that. Um, thank goodness I didn't have any PhD students like this. <laughs> the, uh, the answer, again, plausible, uh, but incorrect. Uh, <laughs> Uh, gives the title of the alleged citation and then gives the text of the alleged cit uh, citation. That alleged quote is itself completely made up by Charles GPT. I can feel myself getting angry at Charles GPT <laughs> as, as I go through this. Okay. Again, the phrase there, astonishing fabrication. Uh, Minimizes, I think. Okay, we went, we we pressed on a little bit. Uh, we asked what other references uh, were there, and there's quite a list there of references in various um, uh, newspapers, uh, <coughs> all of which. Uh, I don't think I'm going to leave it up there uh, uh, for you to waste your time reading it. Uh, None of those um, articles uh, exist. No, there is no known photograph of Ludgate with his machine, if only there was. Um, it's uh, uh, no, no uh, membership of the Cork Literary and Scientific Society, etc. Uh, interesting one at the bottom there. No evidence that Ludgate had applied for a patent. If only he had. Did he ever work as an accountant? Um, this is interesting uh, in that uh, uh, Chat G and B and T uh, now backed off and admitted there was no evidence to that he worked as an accountant, um, but said that he worked on civil engineering, which is wrong. <laughs> so, in summary, <laughs> Uh, that's a very quick uh, run through some of the things which uh, outraged us about outraged us about ChatGPT. <coughs> we were not trying to research ChatGPT. Um, uh, we were uh, trying uh, uh, just to uh, uh, find out what it was. Uh, uh, like as a, a historian's assistance. Um, the uh, summary of, with, uh, of our research was that chat GPT's responses to the 12 questions all were wrong and it produced over 2,000, uh, uh, over a, a thousand words of nonsense in its 2,000 words of, uh, uh, of response. Uh, we wrote that up uh, as a very brief paper, um, acting really as a front end to a much more detailed report 
and the uh, things I've been showing you are all in that report. So let's back off and talk about ChatGPT. It's a, perhaps the prime example of what's called generative AI. Uh, AI which uh, um, produces uh, responses and answers using an immense body of text, uh, all of Wikipedia, uh, um, all of books three. Uh, books three uh, is a not very well known, not, not very well publicized, huge compendium of um, the full text of a very large number of comparatively recent fiction and non-fiction books. Uh, all of those are uh, uh, being used to generate answers um, to questions by um, uh, what at heart is a very simple um, technique, um, asking uh, uh, what is the most probable next word after the set of words we've got so far. It's, of course, much more sophisticated than that. It embodies um, uh, lots of um, uh, la uh, linguistic research and the like. Um, but all it is doing is um, <clears throat> uh, essentially a, a, a probabilistic um, syntactic uh, uh, op operation. It pays, it makes no use of, it can make no use of semantics. It has no understanding of what it is working on. It is merely an exceedingly clever um, syntactic mechanism uh, for producing uh, locally probably um, correct um, uh, text um, of uh, pretty high quality uh, grammatical form, at least in small areas. And uh, no wonder, therefore, uh, uh, that the results it's produced um, can at times uh, be of the form that I've been, I've been showing you. <clears throat> Generative AI works on pictures as well as text. Um, the picture that you say down at the bottom there is a lovely example of an hallucination. The lady, when you look carefully, has three arms. <laughs> uh, that is, a, a, if you like, a real example from the um, campaign literature um, from the Toronto mayoral election uh, of a, a year or so ago. I hate to think what else you could find in the way of examples um, to, sh to show you on a slide like that, but let's not go there. My colleague Brian Cochran asked some, uh, some rather nice questions um, after we'd got this far in our examination, which, because, um, uh, and after we'd published that paper. Um, because we were surprised at the, uh, uh, the extent of interest it, uh, it, uh, it uh, aroused um, and the, uh, uh, the extent to which people uh, um, seemed to think that uh, uh, what we got was uh, some, some important results, if, if you like. We don't know, well, that was... Uh, why that is, is we're, we're not really sure, okay? Is this um, behavior more important than we appreciated? I guess my answer to that is yes. Well, I'll show why in, in, in a moment. Um, is it that the level of hallucination, which was um, really very large indeed in this, in this example, uh, is it proportional to the existing knowledge of the subject? Um, there wasn't um, uh, very much information uh, online about Percy Ludgate. 
very much different inf uh, uh, information. There was a lot of repeated information, but, but not much. Um, so uh, that might be part of it. And <clears throat> we could look at these um, answers and we, Brian and I and our colleagues, were so well versed um, uh, with what was known about Percy, uh, Percy Ludgate uh, that we could easily spot um, very plausible wrong answers. So uh, those were aspects of uh, uh, reasons behind this work. But those are questions we're not uh, trying to do any further work on. We're intending to leave and believe them. What for many years I've always referred to as the artificial intelligentsia. Relatedly, we found out that the um, praise for chat GPT as a historian's assistance that had caused us to do to do to go down this detour was itself written almost certainly by ChatGPT. <laughs> One of the reasons we believe that is the, the author, the named author of that article, uh, is the author of over 50,000 posts on his website about ChatGPT. That's not somebody who's done that, typing at the, time, at the keyboard. Um, his website uh, is the website of a, a company that describes itself as um, one that provides telecommunication services. Um, but um, if you check their website using Google, um, uh, doing a site search on Google, uh, looking for chat GPT, you find that that website uh, has got 175,000 pages on it. It seems clear that that website, and I fear it is not alone, is a contributor to, uh, to what you might politely call an echo chamber phenomenon um, uh, about chat G uh, GPT, which is put, uh, putting a whole uh, uh, immense chunk of plausible, well-written, uh, uh, but untrustworthy information onto the web, uh, onto, uh, onto the World Wide Web. Information, of course, that presumably others are starting to use uh, to find out, and in fact, perhaps uh, to help, quote, improve their uh, uh, generative AI system. So let me try and, and so to speak, uh, contribute to um, undoing this harm by recommending, first of all, uh, the um, uh, report of the ACM Technology Co uh, Council. This came out um, uh, a month or so after our, our paper. I'm not suggesting it came out because of our paper. I'm just getting the timeline right. Um, on principles for the development, deployment, and use of generative AI technologies. <clears throat> uh, it's um, a, uh, a report which is uh, available um, online. Uh, it was, if I remember rightly, uh, also something that appeared in, the, uh, in an ACM journal. And <clears throat> what it... Uh, the one paragraph I've taken from there is, is a summary, um, uh, which is uh, that the, the power of generative AI systems uh, has potential to cause significant and even catastrophic harms, uh, harm, and great care needs to be used in researching, designing, developing, deploying, and in particular, uh, using them. Oops, sorry. The, uh, the report um, uh, centers on um, um, uh, a, uh, 
set of principles. Uh, that's the full um, set of topics in the report. Um, I want to briefly talk about um, <coughs> the initial five there, uh, the, the ones that uh, whose titles are in boldface. <coughs> The, uh, I think, most important uh, um, uh, principle that uh, the report argues for is that there should be limits uh, to and guidance on the deployment and, uh, and use of generative AI. And there's a some text there that um, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, read out in full. Uh, it's important to, uh, to not to limit one, but to, uh, to specialize this, uh, uh, this guidance to the concern for uh, high risk AI systems. Uh, systems for, uh, for, for example, in providing answers to medical questions, uh, those would be ones uh, uh, that I would be very worried about. Uh, I've got, however, <laughs> uh, from what I've seen, the medical community at least is very aware of this and is being very careful indeed um, about its uh, uh, use for uh, of, of generative AI in, in producing advice. Another thing being suggested there that um, Generative AI <coughs> should be used with a human being still in the in the loop. Uh, in particular, uh, taking responsibility uh, for its answers. There's a couple of other principles there. Uh, one on um, uh, ownership, uh, ownership of da uh, of data. You're starting to find authors now. Um, who are uh, suing AI companies uh, for misuse of um, of their text um, in uh, um, uh, the use of uh, uh, in the building of machine learning um, systems. Another principle uh, listed there is um, uh, to uh, make it possible for. Um, people to um, prevent uh, generative AI systems from using their personal data without permission. The final two um, are uh, the suggestion that such, such systems um, should require uh, you to uh, the owners of the systems um, to um, correct them um, and uh, they should be transparent about the fact that AI is being used. Uh, interestingly, it is very difficult um, for people to find out whether a generative AI system is, be, is being used. Uh, there's been quite a lot of research about this, and all I've read about it um, says that as yet, that research is not very successful. Uh, so uh, attempts, for example, uh, by student um, plagiarism detector systems uh, de to detect uh, the, uh, the use of generative AI, uh, the last I've seen there, indicate that those are not very successful. So we suggested one additional principle, um, uh, <coughs> which is that um, uh, we think people should be given the chance of disabling or bypassing generative AI on the systems that they, uh, they're using. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, that that should be possible until much more progress has been made with the hallucination problem uh, than has been made so far to our knowledge. We have tended to find papers which talk about uh, the fact that the hallucination problem is inherently 
impossible to um, to solve with generative AI of the, uh, the sort of scheme that we've described. One final thing that I would I would recommend that you read is um, from <coughs> the um, most recent, or for probably last but one, uh, co copy of the communications of the ACM. Peter Denning has written several editorials in the ACM um, uh, over the last year in which he's talked about um, uh, generative AI in this, <coughs> excuse me, this last one, he um, asks those four questions and um, gives very interesting answers to them. I strongly recommend um, that um, you uh, seek out and read that paper. So I describe this as a detour. Um, let me revert at least briefly um, to um, our, our main interest. And it is certainly one uh, that we have been back on now for two or three months. Uh, the interest centers on Percy Ludgate, Conrad Zuza, and IBM. <coughs> I have just one slide about this. The most recent development is that we have found the smoking gun. We have found a letter by uh, the uh, patent attorney who um, caused the German patent um, authorities um, to back off a, uh, a publicized plan to um, uh, give Zuzer a patent. A letter to that uh, patent attorney sorry, uh, <clears throat> a letter by that patent attorney, which admits that uh, he was being helped by IBM. We found not only that, but we found several other patents he was involved in, uh, where these were pa patents uh, on behalf of IBM. He was very much a patent attorney working um, for, for IBM. Probably only from about 1959 or 1960, which is when he had br been brought in uh, to work for Triumph Erica. We also believe we found the gunman, a um, Dr. Walter Hoffman, um, uh, was at this time head of the patent department uh, at IBM Zurich. <clears throat> His previous career um, had been as an academic at the University of Darmstadt, uh, where was one of his specialities uh, was researching the computer literature and collecting it. Uh, he then um, uh, uh, moved to IBM, uh, to the patent um, department there, and became, and became um, head of it. He published a book, Digital Information Processes, is the German title, and uh, so the English title of, of the book, which was a, a set of quite scholarly articles um, uh, uh, about computing and, uh, and its history. And uh, he provided a massive bibliography at the end of this book, uh, which uh, contained a bibliograph bibliographical reference, a full one to, to Ledgate. We had done a huge amount of research trying to find references to Ludgate. Um, we had found only two, essentially, between about 1915 and 1970. Um, <clears throat> one of these had been uh, at MIT before the war. Uh, another one after the war had been uh, Morris Wilkes in 1956. Probably, possibly from that MIT one, we're not sure. Um, but here was uh, uh, Hoffman um, with a very full reference um, to Ludgate, which made 
made it absolutely clear to us that he had read all of Ludgate and he gave a citation which was more detailed uh, than anybody previously. And by now he was head of the patent department. No, we do not have a, a letter um, uh, which actually names him. This is just a, an allegation on our part uh, that he was the gunman. However, it seems to us that there is a degree of plausibility here that chat GPT would have been proud of. So, <clears throat> what is interesting to speculate on, but is far beyond our expertise, is what would, what are the consequences, what would have the consequences been had Zusa obtained this patent? Certainly this was before the ENIAC patent. Um, and um, uh, we know that at least in terms of huge expenditures of, um, uh, of legal fees and the like, um, the ENIAC patent suit was massive. Um, uh, that litigation, um, I forget the date now, 19, about 1972, I think, um, involved, um, what was it now, a hundred days in court tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of pieces of evidence, uh, a, a transcript of the trial, which I ha have on microfiche, uh, which is after, absolutely massive. Uh, a transcript of a trial which looked in detail into the history of computing, mentioned Zusa, but didn't know about um, uh, Ludgate. I'm imagining a trial like that, uh, uh, where the defendant, or, uh, sorry, uh, where the defendant was IBM and the uh, accuser uh, was Zusa. Most unlikely. Um, the, the chances of a European patent causing anything like that amount of uh, disruption or potential disruption to the IBM, uh, sorry, to the uh, computer world seems very, uh, very uh, little. However, we are prepared to say that in our naive view, um, uh, Ludgate's, uh, Ludgate had, so to speak, accidentally, at least some sort of impact on, computer, uh, on, the, uh, on the modern computer industry, um, uh, which is a complete change from anything we've previously known. So, that's the end of my story. One final comment, comment on generative AI. Caveat uh, emptor in excelsis. Or if you like, buyer beware in spades. Thank you. Brian, would you? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm now trying to find out how to uh, uh, get rid of this. Um, I managed to turn it on. Now I can't find out where to turn it off. Not share the screen. It's the question of finding the window which has got that in it. <laughs> Damn me! If you if you close the PowerPoint, Brian, it will stop sharing automatically. While Brian's doing that, are questions from Brian? I've done it for you, Brian. <laughs> oh, I got rid of that screen for you. <laughs> Any questions in the room? So, um, the chat GPT said that Ludgate worked for firms based in London. I wondered whether the chat GPT muddled his name Ludgate with Ludgate Hill and whether they, those <laughs> firms were near Ludgate Hill. You hear the question? <laughs> um, I do know that in our searches, Ludgate Hill was an annoyance to us. <laughs> um, 
but um, <clears throat> a lot of our searches uh, use the Emperor name Percy Ludgate, uh, and that was the way around that one. Um, but of course, we tried Percy Ludgate, Ludgate, comma Percy, Percy Edwin Ludgate, and, and, and the like, and we didn't just rely on Ludgate. And uh, I don't think I could uh, track any uh, response, uh, any reason for blaming Ludgate Hill on any of the, uh, uh, as a cause of any of those hallucinations. I just quickly looked up using my smartphone, which unfortunately doesn't necessarily have a smart operator to go with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looked up the JSTOR for um, transactions of the Royal Society of Arts, which you mentioned, Morris mm -hmm. Wiltz's paper. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, I got about three pages full of Ludgate Hill. <laughs> and not a lot else that I could dig my way through. I, I Next time I go for coffee, I'll pop in and actually have a look at the paper version of Wiltz's paper. <laughs> it's probably the purest way to do it. Well, his paper, which was um, in 1951, yeah. <laughs> um, was um, a paper describing three lectures at the Royal Society of Arts, the first one of which was essentially on the history of computing. Mm -hmm. In the book that he published in 1956, he, he pretty well uh, repeated the text of that, that 1951 uh, into his 1956 book. And that 1956 book is the easiest way of, uh, of finding what he, he said about Ludgate. Uh, Brian, uh, I, I've tried ChatGPT on a fairly advanced mathematical question, mm -hmm. um, for which I happen to know the answer, of course, <laughs> which helps. Uh, and it, it uh, first time it gave complete rubbish, and I just said, try again or something. <laughs> And the second time round, it produced a really superb answer. I, I was really rather impressed. Oh, yeah. Because it, it produced not only um, the answer, but the reasoning behind it in some detail, which was certainly correct. You know, I, I knew enough about the area to know that. Um, so um, I'm puzzled a bit. Um, but I don't think there was much generation. It was more logical deductions from the work that had already been done, I think, in the in the mathematics area. So um, it does seem to indicate that you can get extraordinarily different types of results yeah. from this technology, which uh, uh, you have illustrated uh, rather extensively, can be extremely dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I've seen no claims that ChatGPT knows any mathematics. Um, I, I've not really seen any, seen any claims that ChatGPT knows anything. Okay, What it's very good at is um, uh, using probabilities um, and um, <coughs> uh, lin linguistic rules and the, and the like uh, to put together um, um, text which uh, reads like English and uh, has uh, strong correlations uh, with what it has been given as um, learning data. But before we started this, I assumed that one of the worries uh, <clears throat> about uh, a generative AI system that, uh, and I'd read about them uh, uh, trying to read the whole web, the, the whole um, internet, uh, to learn from it would be think well there's an awful lot of nonsense on the internet i don't think it's the problem is very much the, that it learns bad facts uh, uh, rather the the, uh, the way it puts them together uh, uh, can go way off the rails i always understood ai was supposed to keep learning i guess it doesn't it just simply re reuses whatever it's got to hand. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but um, ChatGPT, for example, um, 
I do. I believe that as people use it, um, then uh, it uh, <clears throat> it starts taking account of um, what inputs uh, uh, it's received. So in in that sense, uh, it, it is uh, quote learning unquote um, through the the way people are using it. Um, the, the world, the AI world, to my mind, confuses a lot of us by the use of anthropomorphisms. Um, I think the word learning, the word intelligence, the word neural, um, all um, are uh, politically extremely successful and uh, very problematic. I agree with that. Bob Eager. Which one mute? That's it, right. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say this is um rather weird actually. Um I've just started reading a book by Morris Wilkes, and it's right <laughs> here. I ha ha had it beside me. That is the book, and I've just looked in the back and found the reference to yeah. Percy Ludgate. So yeah. um I haven't That's actually read that book, isn't it? That is the book, yes. And yeah. I hadn't actually got that reached that far with it yet. I've only got a little way into it. Mm -hmm. But um that's uh, I should be looking out for that now. <laughs> I hadn't <laughs> realized. But it was sitting on the desk beside me when when you spoke. So there we are. That's all really <laughs> I think the problem of chat at PPT is there's such a mixture of really excellent summaries of good information and these terrible hallucinations. I mean, I've been doing it for uh, some other historical research and it's You're going to be closer to the microphone. Answers, but, but amongst them, the rest of it is so good. And that is that is the worrying thing about it, I think. You know, that um, you can look at it and get on certain questions and get marvellous answers and go away saying how marvellous it is. You look at a subject where there is less information on the web, where it has to, um, and it seems to get worse and worse. And I've seen examples where it's confused people with the same surname, or firms that have uh, that were based in different parts of the country and things like this with the same name. Um, yes, it's a, hopefully it will get better. But um, the other thing is, I think it, the quality of the material it's trained on is also to some degree a problem because of course it's only trained on what's publicly available any papers in academic journals and things like that are very often hidden from it so it doesn't always get the best source of information but um you know uh, um i think if you use it on a in a in-house on a fixed set of trained data for a fixed set of questions people can ask it could be very helpful but Letting it loose on the internet is a, another matter. Um, I only partly agree with you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> certainly, if you uh, are using it in a, a sort of a bounded field um, where um, all of the learning data is is relevant and accurate, and uh, and, and uh, uh, you, you know that it's not going to uh, dubious, dubious sources for um, for further uh, further uh, responses. Uh, then that will certainly uh, uh, limit the uh, the sort of mistakes it will make. But because it um, is only using syntax, um, uh, that puts uh, particularly when one. Uh, is not talking about just an individual sentence, but a, a, a long chunk of prose. Um, uh, you, you can uh, get things which are just not logical, uh, do not uh, reflect uh, any underlying uh, uh, underlying reality. Um, and initially, I thought, uh, well. <clears throat> Chat GPT uh, is at least good for writing fiction. Um, but then thinking about it, um, I decided even that's not the case. Um, uh, imagine uh, asking Chat GPT to write you a small detective story in the, si in the style of Agatha Christie. I'm sure it would make a good job of mimicking her style. Um, but um, 
a few pages apart, you will find things uh, and statements made, uh, which perhaps just are completely illogical when uh, when matched against each other. Yeah, I understand why you say that, but it, mm. it would certainly be better mm. uh, with a fixed mm. fixed bend. But uh, no, I've I've found also that you can you can get it to go mm. further and further away by the question if it, by a series of questions mm -hmm. by the way you ask it. Mm -hmm. You know, you you can start off with something that's mm, slightly um, interesting, mm -hmm. but you can mm -hmm. prompt it yeah. to get further away from the truth, which is even more worrying. It, yes. it, it, you know. Yeah, yeah. As you, I think you've shown that by your, the way you were, your series of questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we stop it feeding into Wikipedia? How do we stop it? What? Sorry. Feeding into Wikipedia. Um, that's a good question. I am sure that Wikipedia and, and, and Jimmy, you know, his surname now, um, uh, are worried about that already. I mean, Wikipedia relies on people to collect. Mm -hmm. No, to collect uh, references. Yeah. So there is um there are people there who are looking at it. I know a I know recently where something went into Wikipedia based on a, a very recent paper, but when it was questioned, mm -hmm. then the people maintaining that page took the the offending bit out again. So there is there is some protection there. It's not completely automatic. Oh no, uh, I've got immense respect for uh, the way Wikipedia. Um, tries to uh, uh, police and uh, improve the quality of its uh, 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 of its text. Um, it's just that with the difficulty of identifying um, uh, whether generative AI is being used, um, uh, you're, you're having to trust. Uh, and the notion of trusting G uh, chat GPT, uh, that, <laughs> I just don't see how to do that. No, uh, uh, the more uh, I look at this, uh, 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 it's more it's interesting to see what it says, but I, I wouldn't want to repeat a lot of it. <laughs> Are there any other questions, Brian? Okay. Yes. Can I, sorry, can I, I just respond to a query? The uh, video of the, the uh, will be on the on the CCS website uh, as quickly as we can make it available, which will probably be within a week, and you can get to it via the program page of the CCS website. Sorry, uh, thank you, Roger. Well, Chris, I've hello. I've just tried chat GPT and put in a question about ICL range. It told me that it was that ICL 1900 range was a 32 bit architecture. I then typed in correction, 24 bit, it then changed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, it's just to echo your experience. So I asked chat GPT about my work. Uh, and it came up with a wonderful series of fully cited papers, none of which I've ever written, um, and a couple of books, oh, and a couple of books which I haven't written, but one of which I'm thinking of writing because it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, then, when I asked it about my actual published work, it attributed that to somebody else. So uh, it, it really does need to be taken, as you say, with a, a very large pinch of salt. So There's a very interesting, uh, you know about a lawsuit in New York in which uh, an engineer who'd suffered an industrial injury sued the airline, his employer, and his lawyers used ChatGPT uh, to produce uh, a submission to the court with about half a dozen cited cases from, in front of real judges, total fiction, uh, and the judge in the case uh, fined the, both lawyers $5,000, ordered them to send a copy of his uh, opinion to the judges whom the lawyer had quoted and said, I'm not going to instruct you to apologize because a required apology is no apology. 
I, I'd seen that uh, uh, an account. Uh, I perhaps should have included that in in my talk. I'm just wondering, um, can uh, can I persuade um, uh, anybody who um, has some um, more expertise than me, and this should be easy, uh, on issues of patenting, um, whether they uh, to, uh, to comment on those aspects of th this rather strange uh, bifurcated talk. Sure. Um, my name is uh, Vince Mink. Um, I come from the data science uh, data domains, um, pretty much on the data management side. And I can see a lot of um, uh, negative energy around this ChatGPT at this moment because of the fact that, you know, when we ask something in the ChatGPT line, we sort of like receive instant response. And sometimes you don't want the ChatGPT to give you the instant response because say, hang on a second, I haven't actually tell you what I want yet. And then you... And the fact that it's generative is that it's trying to produce something. And the generative model is at the in infancy at this stage. It is trying to learn, it's trying to gather more and more information. Now, how, how accurate it can produce and how mm. can it can formulate, that is still yet to be decided. Obviously, at this stage, it's complete crap. There's a lot of answers that we, we receive that we don't like. But in my line of work, um, as a software engineers, um, it is heaven for us because um, when we have a piece of code that it would take us maybe five to 10 days to write across to another different programming language, now we don't have to anymore. We just put it that in and then we ask for the request and it just do the translation straight away in less than about five to 10 minutes. And the work that supposed to be done in five days, I can literally finish in five hours just to interact very well. So my, my response to this is that sometimes uh, that chat GPT requires you to guide them really well in order to produce the answer that you want. Obviously, you can't trust every answer that is given. And the referencing, obviously, is, uh, is, is appalling at this point. But uh, I, I'm still positive in... In years to come, this will change. This will really, really speed up and change. At this point, it's still at the infancy. Sorry, I'm just throwing my opinion at this stage. Thank you. No, it's really interesting. <laughs> I just had uh, to a point that was only made and touched on the subject that Desmond has made. I think we're concluding that ChatGPT is quite good if the subject is bounded. Um, like, for example, in the legal case, yes, it's not very good at factual research and it does hallucinate a lot, but it didn't stop ChatGPT still passing the US bar exam. So when you've got a structured subject, which is, is well documented, that it can handle. And likewise, with writing code, it's again, it's a bounded subject, there is syntax involved, it can generate that. So those kind of things is particularly good at but not, as we've discovered, obviously, in the talk, the factual historical side. You cannot rely on that. And that comes back to the source of the training data and what it's using, which we don't have access to and we don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. back. Uh, yeah, so just to uh, slightly expand on what my learned colleagues just, not yet, uh, just said is, uh, so most of the discussion previously was about using um, LLMs as a kind of um, conversational knowledge engine. And indeed, they are not very good at that. But it seems that the current generation is a pretty good uh, text transformation system, which happens for very interesting reasons, I think. Uh, happens to have a natural language uh, programming input. But that's sort of besides the point. But they are actually just text transformers. And they are very useful for all kinds of uh, translation tasks. So uh, programming language translation, uh, natural language translation, actually, pretty, GPT would be pretty good at that. Uh, text summarization, and I think that's actually where it's mostly found success, successful use in uh, historical, uh, historiography context, is that uh, it is a pretty good uh, text summarization or uh, te uh, semantic text search engine. So you can throw a huge corpus of text at it. 
in little box and say, try to find uh, fuzzy references to things. Uh, and that, and for that, that it, it seems to be pretty good. So it has nice, so it's not even knowledge related. It's it's just text manipulation. And the confusing part is that it, it's instructed with natural language, but it's not I think it's uh, not a conversational uh, knowledge system. Thank you. Any more questions online? It's kind of going to fill a prize, for sure. <laughs> it's one of the eternal truths, isn't it? Yeah. So if I can throw something into this conversation, my wife is engaged in the translation of the letters of Marsilio Ficino, who was the leader of the, uh, of the uh, Renaissance in Florence in the second half of the 15th century. And he published 12 volumes of his letters in his lifetime and my wife leads a team which over the last 45 years has been translating those letters into English. So I thought I'd see what ChatGPT made of it. So I scanned a page of Latin text, which they had already translated, uh, her very experienced group. Uh, that was actually very difficult because the, uh, PD, the PDF uh, was a big problem in terms of the way it divided the words. But I got over that laboriously, read it in, and it produced a translation. And I said to her, what, what do you think of that? And she said, mm, it's certainly not as good as ours. It's not bad. There are some weaknesses. But the interesting thing about it was not the, the accuracy of the translation itself, but the fact that it added, unprompted, the statement, this text has philosophical and spiritual ideas in it, which I may have got wrong. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, Brian, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. We've all learned a lot about both Percy Ludgate and G Chat GPT. And, and, much much and much appreciated. Thank you. Can you announce next month's talk, which is the November? Yes, with pleasure. So next month, Stephen Keisler uh, will be talking about software archaeology, the Interlisp rest Restoration Project. If you can pronounce that, you're doing pretty well. So that's on November the 16th. Uh, and see, is that, sorry, is that relevant? No. Okay. So if you remember the 16th, ladies and gentlemen, 2.30, Stephen, uh, Stephen Keisler on Software Archaeology, the Interlisp Resur Restoration Project. I'll have to practice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll replace you with chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. Everything's closed. Okay.